Okay, we're back. It's the five o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel here on ThinkTech. Let me throw two words at you and see what you think. Brad Coates. Oh, God. That's Brad Coates. Well, I know what I think. Okay. I think he's a hell of a guy. And he's uh, one of the leaders of Coates, Fry, Tanamoto, and Gibson. That'd be us. You expanded the name. Good for you after all these years, yeah? Yeah. I had run that firm myself for 20 years, then I brought Fry in for another 20 years, and this is the first time ever that we've added a couple of new partners. But uh, And you've managed to weather all the storms. All the storms. Day. We're not dead yet. <laughs> so this book ahead of us, in front of us, on the stand is a book about divorce that you wrote. Correct. You're, you're a very prolific author, as a matter of fact. I have written and rewritten that book five different times for the University of Hawaii Press over a, uh, God, I guess it's going it's on great, a great, great life achievement period. to have done that because it's a contribution to the, the community for sure. Well, thanks, Jay. And so, and, and really, uh, it's a starting point for our discussion today because our dis discussion today springs off that in the sense that, um, you know, divorce and marriage are sort of at the core of our social system, aren't they? Well, uh, they have been. They have been. That's what know, we're going to talk since about a little way, bit today. Way, back. Correct. In the, in the clan of the, of the bear cave, way <laughs> back. You know, the commitment of, of male to female or whatever it is. Society's been structured around changed. that for centuries, and now it's changing really fast. Yeah. So this book is a springboard to our discussion today, which is social megatrends, sea changes, if you will, in the social fabric of our society, not only here, but elsewhere. So let's talk about some of the sea changes you've identified. I made a little list, and maybe we can go down the list that I made on the basis of your list. First, <clears throat> the change of the role of women in our world. Huge. Absolutely huge. The the, the, the rise of the women's movement, the, the rise of the, what they call the she economy, where women start to outproduce men, uh, you know, start to out-earn men. Nowadays, and you've got, you know, the old days, when the, the Donna Reed, Leave it to Beaver families, <laughs> dad brought home the paycheck, you know, mom was around the house. The homemaker. Yeah. Exactly, the homemaker. And, uh, and it didn't give her a lot of options if she got tired of being the homemaker because she didn't have any money a lot of the time. She was barefoot and pregnant a lot of time. Birth control pill hadn't been invented. And they're, they're, Women's, women's flexibility has increased um, dramatically. Nowadays, if you've got both halves of a couple as in the working world, at least a third of the time, the w wife is out earning the guy. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Oftentimes, the main breadwinner. Which, why, why is that, though? I mean, we, we've seen in our lifetime, in our career time, we've seen enormous changes about the role of women. It wasn't, it wasn't only, uh, you know, uh, uh, women's rights. It was, it was more than that. It was a, a social a social change in the balance somehow. Um, and, and it's having an effect finally after all these years. Oh, it's having a huge effect. Uh, you know, it may have been that women were held down. It may have been that women have got a higher EQ than guys do. It may have all kinds of different factors involved. Women are now becoming better educated. Their earnings, in the last, uh, last 20 years, women's earnings capacity grew 44%. Men's capacity grew, up, it grew, it grew 6%. You know, in this high-tech era, women are, find, are snagging more jobs that don't require heavy lifting, don't require manual CEO labor. CEO jobs. So they, and, and major, major stuff, and, and they're taking charge. And then we look in Congress, and we find there are more women in Congress than ever before. It's a really substantial number of this women. This time around, for we're sure. We're at the State of the Union address. It was visible. And uh, th I'm this sure just when changes you, government. When you went to law school, which is even before I went to law school, you know, there were, what, you know, a dozen women in a, in a, in a class in, in law school? My class, not that many. Yeah, and now over 50%. Yeah. More than 50% of the, of the women, get, uh, the people getting higher degrees in business, in law, the doctors, they're, they're, they're women. Women are, yeah. they are, they work harder, they're more serious -er. This is going is to change the their relatively earn, er, relative earning ability? Well, what that does is that women are no longer dependent upon men economically. So that gives them a range of options that is pretty staggering. Yeah. So when, you know, when I write in my book that two-thirds of all divorces, both in Hawaii and nationwide, are filed by women, you know, it's because women hit a, hit a breaking point where they're you know, no longer all that thrilled with taking care of guys. They're exercising their independence. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and the guys sometimes play into it by not doing enough chores around the house, by not, you know, by not being serious enough. You know, guys start, you know, the... You know, they, the, the party animal, you know, I'm going to drink and hang out with the guys and talk locker room talk. That goes on for a long period of time with guys. And, uh, you know, and you and I are just now growing out of it. Yeah. But for women, you know, they're, they're, you know, they may have a lot of fun in college and, you know, and drink out of beer bongs or whatever. 
But, it, you know, at some point they start thinking about, hey, you know, I'm going to have kids. And if I'm going to have kids, I, I want to have a responsible adult to help me raise them. And we got to have a roof over the head, which means we, you know, my husband's got to have a job. He can't, you know, he can no longer just be zipping, you know, hanging, hanging out with the guys. Uh, he's got to have a serious job. And, and the criteria that women have start to get more serious. And sometimes guys don't measure up. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the old macho thing is out. And a lot, of people, a lot of men are carrying that around, even, you know, when it's really old hat. But let me ask you a global question, Brad. Um, you know, you got, you got the U.S. You're talking, it seems like you're focused on the U.S., on the cities, you know, the middle class, the, uh, the professionals in the U.S. But let me give you Bolivia for a minute, or Romania, or Africa, or the Middle East. Yeah. Um, you know, they, women have been put down for a long time. And, and are still put down. And are still know, put down. How would you like to be the fourth wife of a Muslim? You know, exactly, yeah. exactly. So the question I put to you is that this is, this is visible to the world. The phenomena that you're describing are visible to the world. And it's not that the people in these other continents and countries where women have been and are still being put down don't know what you're saying. They know. They can see it happening. They can Not only the because they watch Think Tech either. Not <laughs> <laughs> it's all on their cell phone. They see so what's happening. If you're looking for megatrends, you know, do you include the fact that this is going to have an effect on the social structure uh, of Romania and Bolivia and Africa and the Middle East? Well, so far, it's mainly America and the Western world. But it is the ripple effect is going to be inevitable. You know, it's estimated that globally, 38% of all men don't do any chores at all. I mean, in, in, in America, you know, it's, they, they've done that. They've traced it down to where women are doing uh, 102 minutes a day of chores and men are doing at least 48 minutes a day. I don't know who does these studies, but that's what I've got. You know, I've, I've read. Well, there was up. an article in the paper not too long ago about Japan, about how the, you know, Donna-san at home, I mean, the, the man, right? You know the term, Donna-san? Right, right. The Donna-san at home didn't do any chores. And the woman now was working and then coming home and doing right. the chores. And there was a lot of resentment about that. So uh, at, least in the, at least in the U.S., we're maybe doing somewhere to a half to a third of the chores, the, you know, the house husband, whatever. But 38 percent globally, men don't do any chores at all. Maybe take out the trash. I mean, that's, you know, that's bound to put a burr under the saddle of liberated women. And women are getting increasingly liberated, as we're witnessing. OK, let's talk about the, the way that social trend um, affects itself, re reveals itself within the marriage, assuming the marriage continues. Um, does it mean, I mean, like in the Chinese sense, a lot of Chinese men and women in families, the, the, men, the man has his, has his finances, the woman has her finances, never the twain will meet. You know, they both operate separate financial worlds. Um, you think that that is going to happen in other places as well, uh, where they make, you know, contributions, the woman makes a greater contribution than before, but it's not a pooled it's not a pooled resource anymore. They operate individual financing, financial arrangements. You think that's going to happen? Well, it's, it's certainly happening in the U.S. And most of my research has been in U.S. oriented for, for the Divorce of Decency book. But, yeah, it's bound to ripple around the world. Um, but you've still got places, you know, Saudi Arabia, women are just now starting to drive. So maybe they can drive to a job. Maybe they can get a job. Maybe they can get their own paycheck. I mean, you know, they got a, they got a ways to go. But in Western Europe, women are, are absolutely starting to run the show and and the british have, have got a term called free males they they, they that was a current term that was males? coined free well, males a, they're, they're free, who they're is free, free of males that's right <laughs> the number of women living alone between 25 and 40, uh, 44 in, in britain has tr doubled in the last two decades and nowadays many many women would prefer to live single than they would to have a husband anymore when i see, when i do a divorce especially for an older more mature woman if, if i do it for a guy First thing he's thinking about is, okay, where do I get my next wife? If I do it for a woman, it's like, I don't want to have another guy in my life to have to I take I don't care need of. another guy in exactly. my life. Yeah, my exactly. Life. So let's, uh, let's talk about, um, you know, I want to continue that. Uh, maybe this is not in the order that you had in mind, but to marriage itself. Because this suggests that women are no longer tethered to their husbands. That's exactly right. And, and maybe something is changing with respect to, you know, the, the whole institution of marriage. Uh, tell us what that is. Well, what it, what it is, is, uh, well, here, let me, can I read a couple statistics? This, this is the modern Wahini's world and how things have changed for women compared to the Donna Reed days. 36% of women surveyed said they would not marry the same husbands again. 36%, that's over a third. Only 12% of married men admitted that they had picked the wrong wife. 51% of all American women are living single as of 2006 and 2008, and now it's got to be far more than that. 
Um, you know, best, based on average wage calculations for services rendered, fatherly duties valued at about $20,000, maternal labors, $60,000. Most shocking statistic of all, 30% of American women who are now married do not intend to be with the man they're currently with five years from now. Oh, wow. And, and it's got to be higher than that if they're admitting that. If 30% of them are admitting it in That's a survey, you can, you can imagine how many of them are keeping yeah. it to themselves. Well, that's, that really is a, a shattering kind of set of statistics in the sense that we thought it was, you know, till death do, do we part. Not no more. That, that's, you know, the religious approach to it. And I don't think religion is all that important. We can talk about that, too. Um, but, you know, what, what strikes me is that this uh, economic emancipation leads to the dissolution of the institution itself. Oh, that they, don't, they, they don't feel the need to be with someone who is, you know, tied up with them, that they can find a life on both sides, they can find a life without their spouse. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, so, and, you and a happy life. Happening. And a happier life. Well, and you, and you, you hit on something. Actually, you're brighter than you look. Um, <laughs> you, you hit on something just as you went through it. Marriage is essentially was a religious institution. Yeah. So as you have the decline of religion in America, you do have the decline of the marital institution. Yeah. Instead, people are getting keep, people are getting married later. I mean, when you and I were in in in, uh, in coming out of college, you married your college sweetheart. Now, guys aren't getting married till about 29, women till about 27. So they're delaying marriage. Over 50% of the, of the people in America now are cohabiting or living single as opposed to being married. For the first time at the last census, the number of traditional American households married with children is below 50%. So you've got more people living, choosing to cohabit and, and or live alone without benefit of clergy, so to speak, back to the religion <laughs> thing, uh, than there are, than there are traditional married families. And then you've got a society that was, of course, built on the traditional nuclear family. So where does that go? And then you've got another self-selecting aspect of this, that college-educated people are far more likely to get married, earn more, be higher achievers, have a more stable financial structure than our high school dropouts who get married far less. They cohabit instead. They have kids out of wedlock, not as committed to the family unit. They earn more. So it's actually increasing this gap between the wealthy, educated, married couples and the, and the lesser educated high school, you know, let's just drink beer and have a good time. Well, I mean, that gap is getting education wider. Education teaches you that For sure. stability is a better way. That's right. That you need to be stable for economic purposes, if nothing else. Well, well married, trouble, cu married couples definitely out-earn single people, uh, you know, by a huge amount. Th there's, there's strength in, in union. That's what it That's is. Right. That's if right. If you work together and you have somebody committed to you and and you pool your funds, you know, you're more likely to have economic stability. What, what's troubling about this is that you see the institution eroding. There are indicia. The, the indicia include, you know, living together instead of getting married, never getting married. I mean, I know people who've been living together for 40 years or more, and, and they're very devoted, but they're not going to get married. I also see, I'm sure you've seen this expand, you know, logarithmically in your career, the number of people who have had multiple marriages, multiple divorces, right. and keep on doing it. You know, what is the difference between that and, and dating one woman after another woman after another woman or vice versa? It just strikes me that we have indicia to indicate that the, the marital institution is on the way out. Well, it's that's very clear. The actual, if, if I can just do it, and we may not get to all of them on this one, but the, the, the six trends that I've identified are the women's movement and the rise of the Xi economy, okay. the increase in cohabitation and the decrease in, in marriage, yeah. social media and the internet, which, which raises the, and it gives, it explodes the opportunity cost. Yeah. What do you mean, finding another, another mate? Yeah, I mean, now, you know, it used to be, you know, if you felt, if I didn't marry my college sweetheart, I may never find a girl like her, and, you know, and, and you know, I better act now because I'll never meet anybody else. You know, you had to, there were two things that used to be required for dating and mating, proximity and timing. You had to actually physically be near. I hope near you guys are writing this down. This is very important. Be, be, you it's on the final exam. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> you had to physically meet somebody proximity-wise. It used to be maybe you met in bars or at other people's wedding receptions. That was a biggie. Um, but, you know, you had to physically meet somebody. Now you can meet 10 people, in, you know, a day on the Internet. And then the timing had to and be you right. You always find somebody who would fit in, in, your, in your expectation. Yeah. The other pillar, the twin pillar, proximity and timing. You could meet Miss Wright, but she was already married to somebody else. That, that didn't work. So you had, to, you had to have both those things concurrently happening in order to form a stable, any kind of a relationship. Yeah. Now, 
the timing is okay. I'll swipe left, or I forget. I've never swiped, but uh, you know, on <laughs> Tinder, you know, you swipe left or swipe right, depending on which one you want to. Yeah. Somebody likes each other. Yeah. You know, if if she doesn't respond, then you just go to the next swipe. So the timing is like instant, and the proximity is basically worldwide. You can anybody who's on any of these sites, you know, in there internationally. So you can basically, when you think what that does, the opportunity cost of giving up on any one relationship is, is far less because yeah. there's another one right around the corner. Yeah. Meanwhile, that translates into a, into a series of shorter term revolving relationships because like I say, you can go out of your first marriage and into a second marriage or you know, out of your first girlfriend and into that, you know, boyfriend, whatever. You, you, you can just revolve in and out of relationships almost instantly nowadays no, we're gonna without having to actually you know, put in the time and energy and, and the good fortune to find the right one. Now we're, you just find them instantly. We're going to revolve too. We're going to revolve into a break. And when we finish with the break, we're going to be revolved right back again. That's Brad Coates. <laughs> and we're talking about social megatrends of which he knows plenty. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we wanna teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book also titled Beyond the Lines and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. I don't you know it's because it's a religious question. Yeah. <laughs> God only knows. Okay, we're live. We're back with Brad Coates. And we're talking about social megatrends, and we're really getting a, a tremendous fire hydrant of possibilities here. And we were talking about uh, the, you know, the undermining, the deterioration of the institution of marriage, at least in this country and maybe other countries to follow, you know, as they see what happens here. So there are other factors, and I wanted to cover other factors with you. One, one factor would be sex. Um, sex, it, you know, sex, it seems to me that the, the whole opportunity of courtship, and sex, the connection between sex and marriage, it's all changed. And therefore, that undermines you know, marriage as a, a home for sex, if you will. Well, there's layers and layers of, of all that, obviously. Uh, the, 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 probably the most obvious one is you know, pornography and, and, and the internet. I, re I read somewhere, I'm, I'm, I think this is about right, that there's more traffic on porn sites than there is on either Amazon or Facebook. Well, I think that's true. And, and it is, what that does, when you think about it, I'm sure you've never been on a porn never, site. Never, never. No, you've heard a lot about them. Though, no, right? I've, I've um, so, people tell me. So when you, when you go on to a, to a porn site and see an 18-year-old girl with, you know, pumped up extremities and steroided this and that and, and, uh, and sexual skills that are beyond those of a normal, you know, normal human being. And then you come home to your wife or your husband. I mean, it's, it's really the problem with, with, with porn is guys. What did you got, call them? You know, sex, sex expectations. Sex expectations. So the guy's sex expectation is, you know, why isn't my, you know, 38, 48 year old wife looking and acting and performing the maneuvers that this 18 year old paid prostitutes are, you know, uh, performing. And that is horrible. It's horrible enough when a, when a gal walks into her husband's office and he slams down the, slams down the lid on his, on his computer because he's obviously been watching, and that is irritating enough. Then to have the sex situation where you, you're, you know, like I say, it's totally, the expectations are totally off the charts. And then here's one that you might not have thought about. As you start to age out, both the genders, you know, biologically, Get old. God, he or she or whoever made it this way, Darwin, you know, both people start to age out of their sexual prime at about the same time. Yeah. Along comes Viagra. And now guys, through chemicals, are suddenly extending their sexual prime another 20 years. And the gals are saying, hey, I thought we were done with this. I thought this was going to be our golden years. We're supposed to be, you know, taking cruises. They, they, and, don't, have, they don't have a comparable drug, I think. Well, that's <laughs> right. And, and, the guy, and, and not only that, I don't know how graphic you want to get. And you've probably never taken Viagra either because a guy like you doesn't need it. But if you, if you were to take Viagra, it's like an instant erection. 
and you're ready to roll. Whereas studies have shown that although guys can come and, and have an ejaculation and, and have an orgasm within you know, six minutes, women take 18 to 20 minutes in the best of time of foreplay to even be aroused for that. So now, and that's in the best of time. Now with Viagra, it's like, okay, I'm ready in 60 seconds to hell with the foreplay. And now a woman who's already a little discontented about her marriage is just like, you know, she's really starting to get upset. What are you doing? And the next thing you know, she's coming in to see the divorce lawyer and saying, hey, I, can, I out earn this guy. I'm doing all the chores. I've had the kids. Women are serious about the maternal instinct. That's hardwired in them, speaking of Darwin. You know, they, they, the, the, the marriage for purpose of, of having a serious guy to help him raise the child and, have, and, the, and the maternal instinct to have children, women stay pretty serious about that. But then after they've had the kids and then you're looking at another four, and plus we're all living longer. So now you need, almost need a different partner for each different stage of your life because, you know, for the next 40 years, you're going to have to put up with this clown and, uh, and you don't need him anymore because the kids are already grown. So now you've got an even trickier situation with a longer as far, life as, to far as the more, Wahinis are concerned. More possibilities, more chapters, more clowns. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. What about religion? Oh, wait, before I get to religion. What about the gay movement? The gay movement is, you know, it's all around us now. Um, there's a liberation involved, you know, in, in sexual identification. How does that affect the deterioration of the marital institution? Well, gay, gay movement was, the, the gay marriage was preceded by civil unions. Civil unions had the effect of establishing that you didn't have to be married to participate in your partner's pension plan, to have the, 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 the financial rights that you otherwise have. Now, all this was set up originally, the tax code, everything else was set up for married people to have an advantage because that was what society wanted to see, married couples propagating and that's what religion America was the way it always used to it yeah. was. And now you've got a situation where you can get your partner share of stuff without getting without getting uh, and medical coverage and everything else without having to get married. So that has had the effect again of cutting against the need for traditional marriage. Yeah. Well, maybe traditional marriage is going to be replaced at least in part by gay marriage. Right? It's happening. Or civil unions it, it, or something. Yeah, or partnership, civil, well, sure. Then, uh, why do civil union when you can get married, right? Well, why get married when you can just live together? That's the other that's, half of That's the, the ultimate yeah, question, right? right? So where, <clears throat> I guess I would ask you, oh yeah, and religion, that's the last one. Religion is changing, and maybe it should after all these years. Um, it's maybe becoming less influential on us, or in some cases it's becoming more influential, but not in the same way. Uh, how does that affect the institution of marriage? Well, the argument has been made by lots of people, lots of smart sociologists that have said, hey, marriage is essentially a religious institution to begin with. We shouldn't be, we should, the government should have nothing to do with it. If people want to get, people want to get married, that's fine, but don't be changing your, your property division laws or your tax laws or everything else based around what's essentially a religious right. Yeah. And, you know, why are we going down that path? And that's going to, you're going to hear those drums getting louder. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if you go back, if you go back to the plan of the bear cave and all that, um, there was a benefit, a purpose, a social purpose, uh, not, even before you get to the religious question, uh, in living together and having a family unit that was reliable, that worked together, a little team uh, that collaborated on the things necessary to help each of them in their family experience. Um, and that, if you take away the institution of marriage with anything less, um, you lose that, or at least you lose part of it. And so, uh, you know, my question to you is, um, you know, how does that affect our society on a macro level? That's got to change. This country was built on the religious notion that the family was the core social unit. And now we're, we're losing that as a, as a primary, a core social unit. How does this affect us? Well, for centuries, the deal was that, I mean, that, that, Men had the roles have gotten so blurred now. Men were masculine; they were the ones that fended off the saber-toothed tiger at the at the cave, at the at the cave door. I think it's actually clan of the cave bear, but you're close. Anyway, they they you know, and the the men were the hunters and the and the warriors, and the women were the hunt, the gatherers and the, and the, and, the, and the agricultural people. And they were the and women raised the children, and, and men you know did whatever guys do. A lot of times it was you know fighting and partying. And so after those, now that those roles have become blended where anybody can just, you know, hit a button on a computer screen and shop off of Amazon, you don't, it doesn't matter whether you're a guy or a girl, this is all gender neutral nowadays. Nowadays, women can fight in the fields and they can have the drone attack, the, attack ISIS just as easily as, as, as the men can. Sure, they can go so, on the battlefield, they do. So that entire set of gender roles has been, has been reversed. 
Yeah. Ironically, yeah. what that has done, as women take more and more charge of their lives and charge of society and everything else, it's, it's taken the stress that men used to feel in business and, you know, oh, honey, I got to come home from the office, have the three martini, you know, and you, you know, just make, get me a slippers and a martini. Uh, <laughs> now, women have got those same stresses all day long, and they don't want to then have to cater to the guys, for, you know, having, having had that. And if there's, there's, whip, there's statistics that have shown they've actually got what's called the happiness hierarchy. Four categories. The happiest, happiest guys are married men. The next happiest are single women. Third happiest are... Single, single men, <laughs> single men, and fourth happiest are married women. Married women are less happy than single men or single women, and much less happy than married guys. Married guys get the biggest benefit out of a marriage, and women suck it up and do a lot of the heavy lifting, you know, without a lot of uh, appreciation sometimes. So what ha what happens at a macro level? What happens to the country if I if I withdraw this institution, or I deteriorate it, or or change it? Um, you know, what what happens to the country? Do we lose something? In the process, do we lose, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the the male aggressive element in business uh, or in other activities? Um, do we lose the nurturing uh, homemaker attitude, uh, you know, in in women? Um, and does that have an effect on our society? Uh, where are we going with this? Well, where we're going with it is is a major shakeup in in the, in the societal roles. I mean, there's, there's good parts of it. I mean, men are becoming much more nurturing of, of their children nowadays. I mean, men, that you, you, I'm at the office, you take care of the kids. That's changed by a house husband taking care of the kids oftentimes, you know, and maybe 20% of all married relationships. And the, and the woman's the higher earner and she's going, out to, she's going out to work. So there's positives in that. But we've got these situations now where the roles are becoming so confused and the women are taking on an awful lot of stress. Economically, the, the, the social institution of of a marriage has been estimated to be worth a, a happy marriage worth about $100,000 a year. The, the, that's what the economists will tell you. And you make, you make much more money. You have a much more stable family. Nowadays, half of the kids in America born to women under 30 are out of wedlock. So, you know, that's, I'm not saying that's bad. You know, I don't want to sound like a show. Well, it depends pig. on how they handle those kids but, out of wedlock. But if you've, got, if you've got revolving men coming in and out of a woman's life, it, it's been shown that that adds a, about a 15% per partner emotional stressors for the kids. So we're raising whole generations of kids now without, without a traditional nuclear family, without maybe male role models at home a lot of the time, because a lot of these women, especially in the poorer inner cities, are raising the kids alone, and the guys are coming and going, being guys and flaky. And women are picking up a lot of the, a lot of the heavy lifting. And, you know, you're, there's, it remains to be seen what the impact of this is going to have on our traditional make America great again, you know, st family structure. You know, it's not so much the generations that exist today, it's, the, it's those kids. They're, they're the future. And if they don't grow up in a, in a home that says, Johnny, do your homework uh, and, you know, don't get in trouble, um, they won't do their homework and they will get in trouble. And all of a sudden we have a, a society of, of citizens that are, mm, that are getting in trouble. Well, and they're also, a big problem. they're also growing up. I mean, you talk about the, the, the marriage, uh, the dissolution of marriage being more and more common. These are kids who've grown up now watching their parents get divorced. So what are they supposed to, you know, isn't it more likely that they're going to just think, well, this is more natural. I mean, you know, it used to be that if you were a kid who went to, went to high school and you were, you're, you're, you were a, you're living with a single mother, you know, you, you got grief from the other kids. You know, it was almost embarrassing to be, you know, oh, you know, where's your dad? Not like that you anymore. Know, now nobody cares. So, so they're more used to it, so they're going to probably perpetuate that behavior themselves. What do you do, Brad? I mean, I'm really interested in what kind of advice you would give to people who are, say, pres presently married. Uh, stay married, negotiate a solution, negotiate a middle ground, uh, deal with the disparity in income, however it's right or wrong, um, deal with the need to uh, do the household chores and take care of the kids. Uh, what, what kind of advice do you give? I, I guess what you would say from what you've said up to this point is it's better to stay married if you can, uh, but you've got to negotiate an arrangement that works for both. Well, yeah. I mean, basically, given that it's women that are pulling the trigger most of the time, two-thirds of the time, they're the ones that... See, guys will stay in, a, in a, even an unhappy marriage um, if, as long as they can sit in their lazy boy lounger and watch TV and somebody hands them a you know, meal. You know, that's about all a guy expects. <laughs> Women have these heightened expectations for some crazy concept called, you know, 
communication, whatever the heck that is, right? And they want, they want their guy to communicate with them. Yeah. If you think about the way men are raised, men are raised to be competitive. Starting with sports teams, you compete to get on the sports team. You you know you have a you join you go to college, you join a fraternity, or, yeah. you know you you, you you become a partner, a junior partner in a law firm. Then you try and become a senior partner. It's all career oriented, and guys, that whole thing has been about competing. For women, they've had the PTA, they've had their book clubs, they've had their you know their sorority sisters. They, it's, it's, it's a much more female bond. This is why they're able to survive in their late sixties with just their female friends, whereas the guys have to immediately go find another wife to take care of them. So what guys have got to do, and I've talked about this on my speeches on the cruise ships that I used to do, guys have got to learn to go from competing to, co to connecting. They've got to, they have got to learn to communicate. This is what the women want. They're taking charge. We better learn to deal with it. You've got to be more like Alan Alda, uh, you know, or you know, whoever your you know, sensitive male figure is, and, you know, and less like that macho J. Fidel. I don't know. I mean, you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've, guys have got to, begin to realize that this that they're going to be the ones that have to go more than halfway towards keeping the marriages together. Do you worry that men will lose their aggressive edge, an edge they need to deal with in the world? Well, I mean, hashtag me too, man. I mean, every man who doesn't at least sublimate his aggressive edge is toast now. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's not a question. It's not a question of, of if, it's, you know, it's now. Yeah. Well, also, you, as you said, you can sublimate it. And still express it and enjoy it, and and you, your your spouse can enjoy watching you express yourself by by sublimation. Maybe that's a point of the future. If you look and see how you know our social structure is going to be, there'll be more opportunities for sublimation. Guys uh, are going to have to get more in touch with their feminine side. I'm convinced about that. You, yeah. it's not the guy can't just sit there and act like a beast anymore. Yeah, what have and we expect not to covered? stay married? Well, what have we not covered? I think we covered everything on your, well, on your list. Well, I don't know how much time we got, but there's a couple more. We'll take a couple of short ones. Uh, gray divorces, baby boomers are getting divorced twice as, at twice the rate of previous generations. And those are, the, those are the people you thought were going to be stable, right? They're going to get to their 60s, their golden years. They're going to live out that happy trails together. And instead, they're getting divorced. 25% of all recent divorces involve people who have been married for two decades or more. So you've got long marriages that are still breaking up due to elongated lifespans, and again, due to further expectations, divorces for folks over 50 have doubled within the last 20 years. Is it, but it's different, though. It's different. Divorce, gray divorce is different in the sense that you have other issues. You, can't, you don't have a spouse who will reinforce you in times of ill health. Uh, you don't have a spouse who will you know, stand with you in difficulties uh, around old age. Uh, and, and that may be exactly not, when you need a spouse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, until death to us part. Yeah. So <clears throat> I wonder how, how that all works out. I mean, it may be that, that the people who are doing great divorce, they think they're still 20. Well, because of the drugs, because of the world around them, um, because it's, it's so easy. The elongated you know? lifespans, everybody's yeah. trying to take, you know, fitness and take care of yourself into older age. I mean, we're, none of us are admitting that we're aging, right? Yeah. Pitfalls. What's your advice to people who consider divorce in, in their gray years? Well... It's hard to say. Uh, and again, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a philosopher. But I mean, you know, people have got to live out whatever stage of life they're going to live. And now that there's so many more options, that is becoming a situation where people are in, inclined to exercise them. Uh, I think if you can, if you can continue to meet each other halfway and, and, and we're in the guy's case, more than halfway, maybe, uh, you know, and hold a marriage together, more power to you. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And it certainly, like I say, has been the bulwark of what America and Western culture was built on. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you go to Scandinavia, nobody's getting married anymore. Women are raising children all on their own. I mean, they're, you know, they're, the marriage rates are just off, way, way down in all those areas. And so this and is... And they've done well with it. And they've I mean, done well it hasn't, with it. It hasn't undermined anything for them. They, they, they enjoy it. They, their society is fine. Their economy is fine. That's right. So if I was going to say one thing, and, and sort of in conclusion... There's an author named Charles Martel who, based upon all the factors that we've been talking about, where there's you know, increased educational atta attainment for women, labor force participation, rise in cohabitation, all these different, all these areas where, where are now the marriages that were once, so the, the benefits that were once associated with marriage are, are being curtailed and being replaced by other stuff. You know, now you've got a situation where, you know, this, this social sociologist, Charles Martel, is, is he's predicting, and I want to get the dates right for you because I know you like specific uh, <laughs> statistics. He's, he's predicting that if the current trend continues somewhere between 2028, that's 10 years from that's now, very specific. and 2034, the U.S. marriage rate will, meet, will reach zero. 
Europe already has the lowest marriage rate on, on record. China, half a million fewer weddings every year than there were the preceding Are year. Are they living together? I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't lived with any Chinese. Uh, <laughs> but but the, uh, the reality of it is that the marriage rate is dropping in all these. As soon as the culture gets more affluent, the birth rate goes down and the marriage rate goes down with it. And when it gets less affluent? Well, when it's, you the know, reverse, what it? it was built on was what the, you know, the next generation, the, the agricultural uh, rotation out of the clan of the cave bear, after you're through killing the saber tooth tiger, tiger, then you're a farmer in Nebraska or the Ukraine or wherever, and you need, you know, the woman home to, you know, women stirring the pot and raising a baby on her, you know, and, and, you know, you didn't have daycare coming in. The wife had to stay home and take care of her own kids. You couldn't go out and get a job with IBM. And the husband was out plowing the fields. And you needed three other kids to help, you know, pick, pick the apples off of the tree and, and can the peaches. You needed these big families and you needed them to all be working together as an integrated whole in the agrarian economy. In the industrial economy, sky's the limit. Everybody goes whatever direction they want. I just want to add one point before we close, and that is this. We are social animals. That's the operative word here, social. Um, and we, we have needed, not because religion required it or, or the state required it, we have needed to have the family unit for support, um, because we're social animals. And if we are going to drop marriage or reduce the incident of marriage um, or somehow change the institution so it is not like it used to be, I think we still have, we're still social animals. And therefore, we have to have friends. We have to have people we can talk to, people we can bounce off ideas. And the problem I see when you mix all that up together with the fact that we live on the internet. We live with machines, not people. We spend less time engaging one-on-one, -on -one, you know, exchanging thoughts and, and feelings and telling our secrets. Um, and, and, you know, that, that leaves us kind of in a vacuum. If we don't have a marriage and a close relationship through the marriage, and we don't have, and we have more mm, mechanical, electronic relationships, if you will, uh, we've lost something. And that makes us more vulnerable. Uh, comment? I think you're 100% correct. I mean, this whole situation of everybody, you know, having their smartphone as their closest friend and, you know, virtual friends replacing, you know, real friends and face-to-face, -face, you know, re interactions uh, replacing, you know, being replaced by, you know, like I say, uh, texting everybody and, you know, I mean, it's crazy. It really is crazy. You're losing the human element and, and it's becoming more robotic. I mean, there's no question about it. It is going to be, you know, the men versus the machines before long. And, yeah. and that's nervous making. That'll be a different life. I mean, even the even the smart guys, you know, guys guys like uh, 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 the, the Tesla guy, Elon Musk, or or uh, uh, the Microsoft guy, you know, they're they're all highlighting the the, the concern over the over the, the detachment that takes place when everything becomes too automated and you lose the personal touch. We have to watch this, you and me both. We have to revisit this as time goes on because other thoughts will occur to us. Well, keep having me on your show for interpersonal relationships. You can do that. Well, I, I need the personal relationships. So do you. So let's do it. All right. Aloha. Thank you, Brad Coast. Always good Great to see to you, Great to have Jay. you here. Yeah. Aloha.